Today on Lockdown Red Wings, the Detroit Red Wings beat the Vegas Golden Knights 3-2 in Vegas in what was probably their most complete game in at least the last few, and they snap a three-game losing skid in the process. You're Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am a podcast producer for the Daily J, WWJ News Radio podcast. While Scotty is the host over at Locked On Tigers, as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. Check out my Daily J episode I did on uh, the Van Gogh exhibit and the controversy around the allegedly stolen art piece. So I'll get that quick plug in there real quick. Uh, the Red Wings beat the Vegas Golden Knights, held on to beat the Vegas Golden Knights 3-2 uh, to two in Las Vegas. And we're going to talk about that, break down the entire game. There's a lot of good to take away from this game. And it feels like it's been a while since we've been able to say that. But then in the segment three, we'll preview the game against the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, but to lead off with this game, Scotty, um, when it, talking about the Red Wings of late and then the Red Wings that we saw tonight, and we're recording this at literally one in the morning. <laughs> it's like right where we're at at the moment. Very tired. Uh, we were both very tired. But it's kind of funny. I feel like I've been noticing this trend is we go on our podcast and then we talk about what we see as recent trends with the Red Wings and what's been happening with this game and how blah, 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 X hasn't happened. And then the Red Wings go out there and then they do that thing that we said they haven't been doing. And what I mean in this instance is they have failed to play a complete 60-minute game all season, it felt like, and especially during this trend. And they've been really struggling to play good defensively. They've been really struggling to keep pucks out of the net. huso has been playing poor. Those are all things that we've commented on, and it feels like the last two weeks – and while I'll argue it wasn't a, still a, a complete 60, it was the closest to a complete 60 game as we've seen. Huso played great. I think defense, their defense played the best game that they've played in a long while. And they beat the team that's first in the Pacific Division. And it was it was a pretty good game. I'm not going to lie. It was nice to see. Yeah, for sure. I, I don't want to, like, Debbie Downer it. Um, I, I still think that, all of the problems that we've been highlighting all year, like persisted in this game. Like, I don't think that it was just like, Oh, like the, you know, th they fixed everything for a night. Like they still gave up some, some high danger stuff that Huso had to really work through. And, and um, I don't know, D defensively it was a weird game because it was, they Honestly, I want to use the word dominated, but I'm always hesitant to. They looked really, really good in the neutral zone, defensively in the neutral zone. And I, I think we've talked a lot, in the, especially in the last couple of weeks, about how in short spurts this defense will look good when they're aggressive on the forecheck. And this was a game where, especially in the neutral zone, but really just everywhere, when they were chart, like rushing the puck and, and when they were aggressive on the forecheck – they were very successful. And I thought, like, and this is not, this is unrelated from anything we say about the Red Wings. I thought Vegas looked like garbage. I they thought they, they looked really poor in this one. I thought they looked super slow. And the Wings took advantage, and that's awesome. Um, but th this was a game where, where they were very much able to establish themselves as an aggressive forechecking team early on, and they maintained that outside of, like, a, a six minute stretch in the middle of the third period like that it was like the the 12 or 13 minute mark in the third to like the seven or eight minute mark in the third besides that they 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 really were uh pretty successful on the four check and, and I think that's what led to again until that like halfway ish mark in the third period that's what led to a a pretty low shot total for a majority of the game but um, I, I think most of their defensive struggles that we have talked about remained. They just only appeared when Vegas was established and set in our defensive zone, right? Because mm -hmm. that you you know you're not going to have a, a ton of forecheck success when when they're already established and, and setting plays and setting up shots and whatnot. So 
Uh, that is what the, the defensive performance I got out of this game was very much that. Like, they, they really, uh, I mean, as close to dominated as you're comfortable saying, the neutral zone. And then it, it's just when the puck got into to our zone is when, like, okay, we still had a couple of dudes go back door in front of the net. And we still had a couple of those. And, and Huso had to make a couple of crazy saves. But uh, I, they did eliminate a lot more opportunities for sure, just because of, of how they were able to not play really aggressive forecheck play for a minute, for a period and a half, and then just completely fall off the rails or whatever. Like they, in that regard, I agree with you, but um, a lot of the stuff we point out definitely, I mean, was, was, you know, it didn't just go away, but they were, they were successful in that area for sure. See, I, I both agree with you and disagree with you on the defensive thing. Um, I, I, and I say I agree and disagree because point number one is I completely agree that Vegas looked like garbage in this game. They did not look yeah. like they had their legs. But to the Red Wings' credit, like you again, like you said, the forecheck was incredible at forcing those turnovers and creating those opportunities for themselves in this game. Defensively, however, you know the the problems did persist. But that being said, comparatively, I did think they they played a, a stronger game than typical. In fact, sure. I think the Vegas Golden Knights by the end of it, I can have it. Yeah, the Vegas Golden Knights outshot the Red Wings by ten. Thirty five shots on the Vili Huso, twenty five on Aiden Hill. Yet both goaltenders faced the same amount of high danger shot attempts, and Aiden Hill faced one less medium danger shot attempt. So I would argue the Red Wings. Well, again, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Those flaws were still there. It was a much improved effort in the defensive zone at preventing lots of high danger chances. Now, we did see several where Huso came up big and came and had to make a huge save, but less so than on a typical night sure. where it's where the workload and the amount of times you're asking your goalie to make that big save was a lot more manageable for Vili Huso. And I think that's backed up by the fact that if I'm going to pull up the heat map here, everyone's favorite part. Everyone's um, favorite heat map. No, I, I agree with what you're saying, though. Like I said, they definitely eliminated a lot more opportunities for Vegas than opponents usually have against them. I I, I, I 100% agree with that. That's what their defensive strategy tonight uh, uh, allowed them to do. Um, uh, again, my thing was just there, there was still a few uh, when Vegas was like – I guess it really was only that like six-minute stretch there in the middle was. of the third period that I'm really alluded, alluding to, honestly. Well, because if you look at the heat map here, and this, I'll touch on this too right after this. This is a beauty. This is a really, really effective heat map. If the Golden Knights, if the team you're facing has a hotter heat map near their blue line, it means you kept them out of the slot yeah. in a great way. Like there's just a tiny, tiny little tinge of orange in your slot. That means you did a great job of keeping the Golden Knights out of your slot area. Meanwhile, the Red Wings. You know, they didn't have a ton. They only had 25 shots in this game, but a lot of it is centered high slot right in front of the net in the left circle. And then you see that on the left blue line. That's all Jake Wallman. He had three shots in this game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jake Wallman by himself on an island there. We'll call that yeah. Wallman Island back yeah, there. Right yeah, right over here. Right over here. This is this is all Jake Wallman That's territory. That's Wallman Island, yeah. Yeah, because uh, he had three. You can see it. The, the dark blue part is 3.75 shot attempts. And Wallman had three shots on net. So that doesn't even count the amount of attempts he had in the amount of, let me, I, in fact, while I'm doing this, uh, let's go look at how many shot attempts he had. If it'll, if it'll list that for us on his on ice. Um, I don't think it'll list his individual shot attempts, but uh, Corsi four for Wallman was 21. Oh my God. <laughs> now granted that's, that's when he's on the ice. That's that how many shot the attempts the team had. Yeah. But if he's leading the team, that means that he contributed a huge amount of shot attempts. Wolman is definitely the biggest surprise on the season so far. But, yeah. you know, to continue my point, though, Scotty, about this team, and while I'm here, I'll just show it to you guys as well. You know, the Golden Knights had the advantage in Corsi 4 percentage, which is the total number of shot attempts. They had the advantage in shots as well. You can see that 53 slide edge, 52 slide edge, 61% slide edge in or big edge. <laughs> That's a big edge in the third period for a total of 55 across the game. So they had, they were doing a better job at shooting the puck and trying to shoot the puck. But at, again, going back to that heat map, you can see that that only occurred along the blue line. And if you look at then the quality of the shot attempts, the Red Wings dominated this game. And that's, again, reflected on the heat map where their 
strongest shot attempts, their their biggest dark spots on the map come from right out in front of the net. They had a 65%, 61%, and 58% expected goals for percentage. Yeah, not bad. First, second, and third for a total of 62%. So while they were outshot attempted, this was definitely a game where it was quality versus quantity, and the Red Wings had a huge, huge, huge gap in the share of quality shot attempts. And I, I think that that showed. I mean, outside of not even talking about the goals themselves, which we'll get into in segment two, I thought the Red Wings had a lot of really good opportunities right out in front of the slot that they couldn't bury. Oh my God, Michael Rasmussen had like three opportunities himself if he could just have buried the puck. It was, yeah. that's why when I say it wasn't a perfect game, obviously the last five minute stretch, like you were saying, they did not play well as the Vegas Golden Knights decided to start pressing harder. The Red Wings began to bend. And we've seen that a lot out of this team is when the opposing team pressures, they bend. And a lot of times they break. But for the first, at least 50 minutes of this game, the Red Wings hung in there neck and neck with the first place in the Pacific division team and had the better of the chances. Agreed. Awesome. When we come back, we'll continue this conversation. We'll talk about individual players. We got to talk about uh, Raymond. We got to talk about Burt, who did not play at all in the third period. Uh, classic Kubi cannon, Joe Valeno. I think he's underrated. Uh, and then touch on Billy Huso as well. But first, I got to talk to you guys today about Bill Bill bars. Nice. In sync. I don't know if that was in sync on your end, but it was in sync on my end. It wasn't. Oh, okay. Well, that's less fun then. Looking for a delicious treat, but don't want all of the fat and calories. Then you got to try a built bar. We just got through the holidays, and I know my goal is to eat a little bit healthier this year. If you're like me and you want to eat healthier, but you don't want to compromise on taste, then man, we got just the thing for you. You got to try built. With built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously. They're so delicious, you won't think they're good for you. Perfectly Perfect for your New Year's resolution. What makes Built Bar so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That is right, 100% real chocolate. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. And we got good news for you guys. Previously, if you wanted Built, you'd have to go online to Built.com and order it and then wait for it to come via snail mail. No longer is that the case. You can find Built at Walmart, Walmart and Sam's Club. <laughs> Bang! Uh, <laughs> if you go to Walmart, you can get a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. If you go to Sam's Club, you can get a 13-bar box with your hit flavors, brownie, batter, and churro. You will thank us later. And guess what? Only 130 calories and four grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein in every Built bar. So don't wait. Get off your butt, go to Sam's Club, go to Walmart, or you know what? You don't even have to get off your butt. You can always order at bet on or built uh, com. Almost said bet online. That's a different read. Uh, you can order them off of built.com whenever you want. You guys will not regret it. <laughs> so go to built.com, go to Sam's Club, go to Walmart. Segment two, Lockdown Red Wings <laughs> podcast. Scotty's trying to make me crack so bad. With his little <laughs> dumb gestures. <laughs> You're really proud of yourself, aren't you? I, I am. Lucas Raymond is not having a sophomore slump. Early in the game season, in the last 15? 15 for 15 in the last 15. Uh, <laughs> wow, look at that. Crazy how that worked out. Yeah, crazy. Now, I know early in the season, we were even like a little, he started off very slow and we were like, oh boy, is this the sophomore slump? Well, he has proven all of the doubters, including at times us, wrong. And you love to see it. There, there are a few times in my life where I am happy to be wrong. But when it comes to players overachieving expectations, that is a time where I'm like, I'm happy to be wrong. And uh, Lucas Raymond, he now has, I think, 31 points. In 43 games, going to go down to, I think, 14 goals, eight, 17 assists after this game. And he's just been he's just been really fun to watch recently. And he and Dylan Larkin, that chemistry is still 100% there. Even with that third person on their line constantly being shuffled, those two have had that connection as Dylan Larkin fed him that beautiful cross-crease feed. Yeah, no, and and it's better for like everything. It's better for future plans. It's better for depth. It's better for the top line production. It's 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 better for literally everything. So, um, 
awesome to see and something that, again, you know, we, we started talking about it a few games ago now, but for a while there was kind of like an under-the-radar thing that people weren't really talking about or realizing or both uh, that Raymond had – his production had picked up and, and now – I mean, look, the, the last 15 games record-wise has not been good for the Red Wings. So something positive out of this poor stretch is Lucas Raymond, and that's always a good thing. Well, and one thing that we keep bringing up to with Lucas Raymond, I don't know if we mentioned this on the podcast, but we talked maybe beforehand, is that we during this rough – stuff for when we're on air. No, we, we're not friends. We're strictly colleagues. <laughs> um, when we talk about Lucas Raymond and Moritz Sider and their performances this year – I think a lot of the narrative has shifted towards a sophomore slump just simply because they're not rookies. If they were rookies putting up this type of production, like even Cider, 20 points in 43 games, as if this if this was a rookie season as a defenseman, we'd be like, man, that's pretty, pretty solid numbers. But because they both had rookie seasons that were really good, and now this is their sophomore season, we just don't, like, even though their production is very similar, we just seemingly don't don't seem to put much as much fanfare in it because they're not rookies and it's not the young, exciting kid anymore. Now all focus has shifted to Soderblom and focused on Bergeron. So when they produce, we have no barometer for what that production should look like. And so it's just exciting whenever they get on the board. We expect now Raymond and Sider to like crash through some ceiling and take their production to a whole new level. When a lot of times that's not the case. They're mirroring their production and their style of play in a very difficult league, trying to adjust to the teams, adjusting to them. They're still having, especially, you know, Raymond, I don't think ever really gave us too much of a worry. I know Cider did with that pairing with Sherratt. And Cider especially has picked it up into a new gear. But, you know, talking about Raymond in particular, he's always put himself in the right position. And for a while, he just struggled to find in the back of the net. But that's not the problem anymore. He's finding a very even split between finding the back of the net and helping his teammates find the back of the net. Yeah, I, I mean, not too much else to add. Absolutely, though, and and it's um, I mean, I I guess we the only other thing to to talk about is just rehashing the conversation from yesterday, and you know yeah. how how long and how much, how long and how much, uh, seven by seven for both. If I was Steve Eisman right now, just sign those contracts, just get it done. Um. Dylan Larkin got the assist on that goal. As I mentioned, he is now one point away from 400 career points. Good for D-Boss as he continues to try to secure the bag. I know there were some reports about the contract situation that came out on Twitter about Dylan Larkin's side not being very happy about the first, one of the offers they recently got. My warning to you guys as a fan would be don't put too much stock into that because this is how negotiations work. The GM is going to lowball. They're going to counter offer with a higher offer, and then they're going to find somewhere and meet in the middle. The only other other reason I say don't put too much stock into it is because agents also are going to be like, well, we weren't happy about this because they want to put added pressure on the general manager and try to make him look like the bad guy. Right. I, I think the, as, a, as a society, we need to start realizing that agents are playing you. Like the agents are, are playing everyone like all the time. Like that's because their, their clients money is their money. Correct. Yeah. That's, so. that's something that is, is yeah. Extremely common practice to make any, any, any bad offer public is, is always a smart move on the agent's part. Um, yes, agreed, but we're running a lot of time. So let's keep moving here. Uh, we talked about defense. We talked about Raymond. We talked about Larkin, Dominic Kubelik, just classic Kubi cannon on the power play. Right, that baby. power play, we I mentioned this in the cold open. You said it yesterday that the Vegas Golden Knights were the least penalized team in the NHL. And they got one penalty, the only penalty in this game called on them. And the Red Wings capitalized with a classic power play Kubi cannon. Great deceptive pass by Oscar Sundquist. Yeah. That goal was crucial, man. Yeah, big time. Big time, big time. And that's that's why we love Kubi on the power play. I mean, we've talked about that ever since we acquired him, ever since we signed him back in the summer. So um, definitely nice to see. And, you know, it, definitely not as hot as he was early on in the season, but that's expected with a guy that just grips and rips it. So He was on pace for 40 goals at one point. Well, yeah. Okay. We, we knew that wasn't going to do that. But, I, you know, he had a little bit of a drought there, I guess is my point. So, um, 
Yeah, no, great to see. It was, I mean, it was a beautiful power play, beautiful setup, like you said, and everything. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we take those and they ended up being the deciding factor. So he's on pace for, he's got a 0.73. Let's round that up that hundredth up to seven, three. So he's 0.73 points per game. So 0.73, he's still on pace for 59 to 60 points, which is an incredible bounce back season. So I know Dominic Kubelik's been cold as of late or colder, hasn't been scoring nearly at the same clip, but he's still on pace to really outvalue that contract. Um, Now, Vili Husso, you mentioned it. We mentioned it. Great game from him outside of that first goal he gave up where he completely whiffed on the save. But besides yes. that, he made some huge saves, especially down the stretch. Yeah, big time. This is a uh, – I don't want to call it a bounce-back game, but it, it definitely was a – He looked it was sharp. very nice. Yeah, very very, ni- very needed for sure. But it, it was very nice to see him ha- – you know, again, didn't face a low number of shots that weren't exactly high danger or not too – well – Again, there there were definitely stretches and there were definitely some some back doors broken and stuff like that. that he had an amazing save there that probably should have been a goal in the third as well. Uh, kind of mm-hmm. a, a highlight reel type of goal there. So, yeah, like he, he definitely had his moments and uh, faced a high volume more than anything as well. So very, very nice to see him kind of get back on the horse. That's definitely named Friday. <laughs> nice. And uh, yeah, hopefully just like a momentum carrying thing because – goaltending the the goaltending situation is going to come and go with Vili Huso's performance specifically at this point backup goaltender is is going to be a, a whirlwind and a roller coaster of emotions the the how people view the goalie situation at this point is pretty much going to exclusively come going to come down to Huso. absolutely agree uh we got to get to another quick break when we come back we'll finish conversation on this game because we got to talk about the Tyler Bertuzzi stuff Uh, And then we will move on to the Philadelphia Flyers preview. So stay tuned to Lockdown Red Wings. Segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. So Tyler Bertuzzi's last shift of the game. Way too early. Tyler Bertuzzi's last shift of the game happened with 59 seconds left in the second period. He did not play at all in the third period. And of course, immediately when people notice he didn't play, for some reasons, every everyone's first instinct was to be like trade, trade, trade. I know Which half is of mind boggling to me, given We're literally like any any angle you want to look at it. Why it was everyone's first reaction? Oh, like he he got trade. Like a Burke gets hurt all the time because of the style of of hockey that he plays. B what. I, I just I don't understand. Eisenman was just like, yeah, in the middle of the second period, we traded Burt, even though he has like 15 games played this year. Tw- like 15, four points. Yeah. Like, wh- I don't know, man. Like, it, I know that it's, you know, it's Twitter and like, how much are you really going to, how much weight are you really going to put in it? But it was wild to me that like, um, he goes out of the game and it's reported like, yeah, he hasn't been in the game in a while. And like 50 people are like, is it a trade? I'm like, what dude? <laughs> no, like it's not a trade. It's, I think it was like a 50, 50 split of like serious trades and like, no, absolutely like, for sure. But I, I completely agree when people start to be like, why would they, why would, and people started speculating that because recently a lot of NHL executives came together to celebrate Jim De- Devolano's birthday. Yeah. Uh, Iserman, Jim Nil, and Ken Holland were all there. And so, like, when Lidstrom was on during the intermission, was talking about that, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm sure they totally didn't talk shop at all <laughs> with, with a bunch of expiring contracts coming up in the trade deadline less than two months away. Trade deadline's March 3rd, by the way. Another reason why they wouldn't do this trade now, because yeah. it's not even close to March 3rd. Raise that value a little bit on Burt's end, too. Yeah, probably, because he's they are played... Gonna move them. He's played 15 games and has four points. His value is at an all-time low. He's broken his hand twice this season. Why would you trade him now? Low, but it's definitely low, yeah. So you you want to give him some time to heat up a little bit and hope or in hope that he would heat up so that you can raise that value before trading him at the deadline. So I saw that and I was that, that makes no sense. He's definitely hurt. And I was, did did check Twitter there a second ago because I lower I, body again, um, yeah. Yeah, uh Lalone said that he had a lower body injury that was creeping into his game and trainers decided to pull him in the third period. Uh, not expected to be long-term. So yeah, 
I, I mean, honestly, I'm sure that there will be some sort of an update by the time a lot of people listen to this. So, yeah, or just, by the time the Philly game comes around. Just man, he can't stay healthy. It's rough. It sucks. It sucks as a fan, and it sucks for him. It yeah, sucks all the it's way such around. Such an important year for his. Yeah, such an important year for his career. Like that's the really you got to really feel for him in that regard. Like there's nobody who benefits from him getting injured. Like the fans don't get right. to see him play. He's it hurts his chance of getting paid, and then it hurts the general manager's. Uh, uh, um, you know, options on trading him if they decide to go that route at the deadline. So or extending him, like negotiating an extension is really weird now. Like, you know, yeah, it's it's definitely it's rough. I feel for him. So we'll keep an eye on that as the days go on. But this is the Friday episode. So we got to preview our weekend game. The Red Wings play the Philadelphia Flyers this weekend coming up. Philly. Philly. Oh boy. Um, Philadelphia Flyers are seventh in the Metropolitan Division. And uh, this is a home game for the Red Wings as they end that road trip. Split the points, possible points. Got Could have gotten a max of six, got three. So I guess all in all, could have been worse. Still want to beat Arizona and get at least four. Um, but It could have been worse when you put it, when you eliminate who the opponents were. In the end, so if you, if you go, this is my eternal optimism. If you were telling me at the start of this road you trip, you're going to face speak for the last two episodes and you're talking about eternal optimism. Shut up. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, I'm talking to a different person than I was. The I last was three emotionally days. broken the last couple of days. <laughs> all right. But the Red Wings have won one game. And so now I think they're going to win the Stanley Cup again. Uh, <laughs> but if you're telling me uh, before the road trip, okay, you're going to go face Colorado, Arizona, and the Vegas Gold Knights, and you're going to get three points. I'll be like, actually, that's not that bad considering the opponents. I would just assume you beat the Arizona Coyotes and lost in overtime to one of the other two teams. But that's, again, that's just me. That is literally me trying to, like, find a silver lining anywhere. In reality, you know, I think if you would have told, I think if you would have told people that you, like, before the three, this three-game stretch, if you were like, hey, you're going to get three points, but you're losing to Arizona. I think then everybody would be like, heck yeah, like sign me up. But I think if you said, if you didn't highlight the fact that they specifically lost to Arizona, then I think people would probably want more. Does that yeah. make sense? I think so. I think I follow what you're saying. Okay. And I um, might not have been English. I'm very tired, but it's now 1:23 in the morning as we're recording this. So, anyways, the Philadelphia Flyers, seventh in the Metropolitan Division, coming to LCA. This team is weird. Like they they were supposed to be bad. Like they were trying to lose. Like that they they were mm-hmm. trying to like oh the you know the Bedard tank season that a lot of teams signed up for. Like they were supposed to be a part of that, and now they have like close to your point total like that and that's not like obviously the wings have been have been sliding in the last month or so and whatnot but um like the the flyers have won like seven of their last 10 so like it's 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 both you know what i mean it's just like this weird thing where they're i don't want to say they're like way better than expected they're still going to be nowhere close to the postseason but um like, it's definitely just a weird thing because I, I had them as one of the worst teams in the league going into the year. Oh, and same. then now they're they're putting together a middle-of-the-pack season. See, I disagree with you on this, though. I think the fans expected them to be part of the Bedard sweepstakes, but I think the Flyers ownership group and general managers signed up to try and make the playoffs. If you look at the uh, acquisitions and the extensions they signed in this offseason, it feels like a team that was gearing up for a postseason run when the team's not built for that, the extension yeah, of Rasmus Ristolainen, the hiring of John Tortorella, that, they traded Giroux. Yeah, because it was, but they they've they've quoted on, they're on paper having said been said that we're not rebuilding, we're retooling. Like they're they're trying to no, do this I, on I the fly and that, stay relevant. But like all you know, what front office says they're rebuilding? Steve Eiserman's front office, day one of his. Uh, general I mean, manager. I <laughs> guess, but the, I I feel like that's. Okay, I mean, fair enough. Like, but, I'm not going to keep making but in, counterpoints, I guess. But. In, in your defense, Ken Holland always said we're retooling. The general manager of the Vancouver Canucks just this week is like, we're not going to rebuild. We're going to retool despite that team sucking. So it does happen all the time. It, it just felt like the Philadelphia Flyers really wanted to not be 
in the Bedard sweepstakes, but they were going to be in the Bedard sweepstakes either way. Um, but Travis Konecki is going a long way to keeping that team, you know, from being a bottom tier team. Yeah. No, he's got 48 season. points in 40 games, 24 goals, 24 assists. And then Carter Hart having a bit of a bounce back here. I think his save percentage is 907, which I think is Carter really Hart, close to Devin. league average. I think in goals above is expected. He's like one of the best goalies in the league at the moment. Like he's having a, a heck of a year that might, that information might be like two weeks old, but like he's still regardless is having a, a really solid year. He hard is somebody that I really liked in his draft year. And I've always kind of followed just because I, I, um, yeah, I, I really liked him when he was a prospect. So kind of cool to, and, you know, there's just like he got called up and people, oh, he's getting called up too early. And then he did well. And then he had like a very high expectations right away kind of a thing. So cool to see him get his uh, his feet under a little bit. more. He is 11th in the league currently in goals saved above expected at 9.74. So he has definitely been go. performing very well. Um, while I'm here, how far has Vili Huso fallen? He's not even in the. Let me see if I. F this. He was in like the top 15 at one point really early on in the season, I feel. At one point, he was top 10. He was like ninth, I think. Yeah, like pre, pre-American pre Thanksgiving. Yeah, oh. he's falling outside the top 50 now. It looks like he might have a That's negative rough. goal saves above expected. Magnus Helberg, number 52. Philly Huso, 60, negative 2.03. It's been a rough stretch for him right lately. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've highlighted why. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> anyway, Scotty, any final thoughts over under for this game? Is, um, is this, they're not going to have it up yet. It's too early. So let's yeah, I I don't know. I uh, I guess I'll take the under in that one. Um, I'll take the over. Okay. Uh, no, I mean you have a better, in my opinion, I think you have a better overall roster than the Flyers. Like mm -hmm. I think that that's a and it's at home. Like that's that should be a win if you Saturday been, night. If you yeah, if you would have asked me. Uh, going into the season, if this was a game that we would have won, I would have said absolutely. So I guess I'll maintain that, but uh, definitely not the the bottom feeder flyers that I think a lot of people maybe expected going into the year. Um, no, I, I think that's it, though. Cool. So we'll be back on Monday with we a post-game recap. Same time, same place. But online, baby. Every day. But online.